Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Carlos Vargas Ramos. I am uh, the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, Director of Public Policy, Development, and Media and External Relations. Welcome, everybody, this afternoon uh, to this webinar, Post-Disaster Recovery in Puerto Rico and Local Participation. This is part of a series of webinars we have been conducting at Centro looking at the impact that the several crises that have affected and afflicted Puerto Rico over the past few years uh, continue to affect and hopefully providing solutions and recommendations on how to address these problems that the island of Puerto Rico and its people is facing. We are going to begin with uh, Ariam Torres Cordero, who is both a central researcher as well as a doctoral uh, student in the urban planning department at the University of uh, Illinois Urban Champaign. Um, and uh, his presentation is, what is possible policy options for long-term uh, disaster recovery in Puerto Rico? Hello everyone. My name is Ariam Torres. I am a PhD student at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I'm also a visiting professor at the Graduate School of Planning at the University of Puerto Rico at Rio Piedras. And my presentation for today is titled, What is Possible? Uh, Policy Options for Long-Term Recovery in Puerto Rico, and I hope you enjoy it. We can often identify unjust outcomes resulting from disaster policies that fail to satisfy basic needs or that underserve disadvantaged populations. What is less clear is how to design and implement successful programs that result in better and more just outcomes. So in search of what is possible, I explored CDBGDR governance models across different U.S. jurisdictions and examined some of the strategies used. Findings suggest that a great deal can be improved through an equity-oriented interpretation of federal guidelines and the exercise of bureaucratic discretion and by enabling networks to build local capacity for community and economic development. My research is a comparative case study research of CDBGDR governance models in Louisiana, South Carolina, Florida, Texas, and I also include Puerto Rico. Before getting into the case studies, I want to talk about the existing and available models for the use and management of CDBGDR funds. The Department of Housing and Urban Development allows CDBGDR recipient governments to establish their own organizational model for designing and implementing recovery programs. These are the direct implementation model, the partnerships model, a method of distribution, or a hybrid option that is basically some sort of combination of these different models. In a direct implementation model, the grantee develops or expands in-house capacity to directly administer the programs in all of the eligible impacted areas. This could be by a direct procurement of contractors to manage or implement specific portions of a program or by distributing grant administration among peer state agencies or municipal governments. In the partnerships model, the grantee delegates distinct responsibilities or programs to other state agencies, local governments, and or nonprofits. Finally, the method of distribution allows for sub-awards to sub-recipient local governments to further define and administer projects and programs at the local level. And the distribution could be through regional differentiation, meaning that certain places are prioritized over others or that different programs apply to different areas. And the distribution might also be through competitive processes of requests for applications or proposals. It is important to mention that these models are not necessarily mutually exclusive and grantees can develop a hybrid governance model and combine different approaches. Uh, certainly, when thinking about other U.S. jurisdictions to draw lessons from, it is almost inevitable to examine the case of Louisiana after Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Like Puerto Rico, Louisiana faced many bureaucratic hurdles mainly due to its lack of administrative and economic capacity and lack of trust from the federal government. In the paper, I go on into some important details about the case of Louisiana after Katrina in 2005, but here I only have time to say that they implemented a hybrid model, but it was a highly centralized and mostly direct implementation. Overall, it is really a great case to draw lessons on what not to do in terms of CDBDR governance and the institutionally led recovery process in general. In Puerto Rico, however, we have adopted many of the same practices that Luisiana adopted back then. We have implemented a fairly centralized operational structure and have hired several of the same consulting firms to work on the design of many of the CDBGDR recovery programs, including the Reconstruction, Rehabilitation, and Relocation, or R3 program. I will not go into the details of the Puerto Rico model here, but I will take this opportunity to comment that the Puerto Rico organizational model is one that, despite being hybrid, in that it combines direct implementation and uh, the sub-recipient agreement distribution method, 
It is highly centralized at the state level and shares many similarities precisely with the Louisiana model uh, for Hurricane Katrina. But even in Louisiana, three years later, after the 2008 hurricanes Gustav and Ike, Louisiana determined that it was in their best interest to allow the most impacted local governments acting through subrecipient agreements to decide which recovery programs they wanted to develop to meet their assessed unmet needs. This time they developed two different methods of distribution, uh, sub-awards to sub-recipients and sub-recipient agreements through a competitive request for proposals process. So quite a different approach and as you'll find in my paper, a better one. Let's take a look at the case of South Carolina. Uh, in response to the intense flooding left by Hurricane Joaquin in 2015, in addition to the state of South Carolina, there were other uh, grantees of CDBGDR funds within the state ju jurisdiction. And these were Richland County, Lexington County, and the city of Columbia. And this is one of the most decentralized cases in CDBGDR governance. It is almost at the other end of the spectrum when compared to Louisiana post Katrina case. At the state level, South Carolina adopted a hybrid model combining the partnerships model with the distribution method. In the case of Richland and Lexington counties, they both, at the local level, they both opted for a direct implementation model. And finally, the city of Columbia also established a hybrid model combining partnerships to implement some programs and competitive application cycles for others. In the case of Florida, the state opted for the regional differentiation method of distribution. First, it was decided that CDBGDR funds will be used in counties that suffered the most damage to housing and public infrastructure. In total, three classifications were established. Monroe County uh, being the most impacted, statewide counties, and smaller development counties. The interesting thing about Florida case is that the state recognizes that not all areas suffer equally and that some regions need more help than others. So the Presidential Disaster Declaration establishes the areas eligible for CDBGDR funds, but the state has the ability to prioritize certain areas and set the rules for engagement. Also, although it is the state that manages the programs, instead of adopting a direct implementation model for housing recovery programs, they give local non-governmental entities in each region the opportunity to participate in the process. The next case is Texas after the 2017 Hurricane Harvey. In their preliminary damage assessment, the state identified Harris County and the city of Houston as the most impacted areas and decided to allocate funds directly to both jurisdictions. And along with those funds, they also gave both Harris and Houston the opportunity to plan and determine their organizational model. So Harris County and the city of Houston chose to develop their own local recovery programs and each prepared what is known as a supplemental action plan, which were submitted and subsequently approved as a substantive amendment to the Texas State Action Plan. And what is very interesting about this case is that not only were the most impacted areas prioritized, but they were allowed to lead their own planning processes where both Harris County and the city of Houston were able to set the housing and infrastructure priorities and engage their local constituents in a more accessible forum. Okay, so what have we learned? Well, for Puerto Rico, as I mentioned uh, earlier, a great deal can be improved through an equity-oriented interpretation of federal guidelines and the exercise of bureaucratic discretion, just like most of the other jurisdictions do, and enable networks to build local capacity for community economic development. And I don't have time to elaborate much right now, but I do want to mention that within the network enablement, there are three important points. First is understanding planning practices and mechanisms used by civic sector groups and organizations. And we all know that the civic sector in Puerto Rico and in the diaspora has done an extraordinary job in terms of recovery. But the question is, how do they do it? And what are their preliminary planning practices? Also, it is worth noting that when we talk about the civic sector, we're talking about uh, foundations, house, housing developers, community-based and grassroots groups. The second point is designing and implementing training and development programs. And here I'm not just talking about job training, I'm talking about popular education and the development of community and organizing uh, and planning skills. And finally, it is important to anchor and, and build coalitions. It does us no good to have all the federal money for recovery if most of what arrives circles back. Um, there has to be integration and it has to be designed and executed. That is it for my presentation. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, please feel free to ask me any questions or share any comments you might have. Thank you, Ariam. I am going to ask now all participants, uh, all panelists rather, uh, uh, to uh, turn on their videos uh, to get into the last set of Q&As. Uh, of course, I am going to target the first uh, set of questions 
uh, to the last two panelists, uh, Ariam, um, uh, uh, Ariam Torres and uh, Edwin Melendez. Uh, the first question is a little bit uh, more broad. Uh, you know, it comes up from the Q and A, uh, and it refers Edwin. I'll, I'll, I guess I'll direct this one to you. But you know, any any other panelists who would like to tackle it uh, uh, should go ahead. Uh, in terms of the revision of funding uh, plans, uh, are they uh, are they going to change now that the Biden administration has announced the release of funds dedicated to Puerto Rico uh, that had been withheld by the Trump administration? If the, if are there any plans within the government of Puerto Rico uh, to uh, change the spending plans, the funding plans? Uh, on the island? Will they be increased? Um, well, uh, that, that's a, a somewhat complicated question because if you follow the money, so to speak, right, you start with congressional appropriation, that's the $56.5 billion approved for Puerto Rico. That's our Marshall Plan, right? That, that money has to be translated into programs and the allocations have to be made by FEMA and HUD the administration to those programs, right? Then they have to approve the sort of the programs, the proposals that, that are based on the on the plan of action of the Puerto Rico government that, that Core 3 and the Department of Housing propose, right? And I'm explaining this in some detail because we need to understand that even if uh, when the monies are released, what I try to do in, in the presentation is to say, it is funnel, right? Uh, the, you know, to contractors or to government agencies and so forth in different ways. That was Ariane's paper, right? How these things are allocated. When they do the NOFAs, by implication, they're already deciding the policy of who can respond to those grants, okay? That's the problem that Ariane is addressing. Now, let's assume that everything is pro local organizations businesses and nonprofits and co-ops and what have you. The problem is that those organizations need to have capacity to implement those programs, right? So it's kind of an iteration of things that create the situation that we are where monies are not flowing, right? So if the Trump administration prevents money from flowing from HUD and FEMA to Puerto Rico, right? That holds the flow. If when it gets to the, to the Department of Housing or to FEMA, those release funding, right, are not implemented into programs that are inclusive, right? That holds the flow of funding to local organizations. And even when whoever the grantees are or whoever the contractors are get the funding, they can decide to engage local resources or not and how they engage them, right? So it's a it's sort of a, you need to see this as, as a continuum. It's a flow of water that can be interrupted in so many places, right? So the, what we're trying to do from the grassroots up is to empower people to understand that process and to create the organizational capacity to be able to respond to the complexity of this of these NOFAs because these are, these are complicated programs, right? So we think there are several strategies that are you know, right there. One is entering into partnership with organizations that have done these programs and have the experience. There are very few of those in Puerto Rico. So we encourage partnerships with nonprofits in the US, say from the diaspora, that have the capacity and want to do the partnership. We also like to see more partnerships in Puerto Rico between organizations that may have the, the balance sheet, so to speak, because these programs are complex. You know, you have to do all the work and then you're reimbursed by the, pro, by the government, right? In mo most of these programs, you need to be a robust organization to be able to implement it. And when you get the money, you need staff that is able to implement these particular projects, right? So it's a complexity. And I think from, it, you know, we, the authors here, are looking at this from the ground up perspective, right? So the question is, assuming that we can solve, you know, the Biden administration can solve the flow problem, right? You're still not gonna get that funding 
you know, remember, it's, it's like a funnel and it has several ways to go, right? So we, we need to work at, at both levels, the policy level, reforming how the monies get to the grassroots, and then the capacity of the grassroots to actually capture this funding. It's our Marshall Plan, but it can be done by outside companies altogether, right? So that's the challenge that we face. Uh, you know, the good news is that there are, there are capacities in Puerto Rico, both at the staff level and the organizational level. We just need to harness them, you know, through coalition building, through capacity building, through partnerships, and try to move the, the you know, the movement, the, gr the ground up movement, right, from the bottom up, as they used to say, right, to, to capture this funding. So I'm sorry for the long explanation, but I think it's to the crux of the matter how these different papers come together, right? And by the way, right now, the rehabilitation of housing is being done by nonprofits with charitable, philanthropic, and private sector donations, right? The, the, the program that is supposed to do that as of last year, end of last year, reported 26 homes completed out of funding for way many more thousands of housing that they were you know, given money to do. That's the problem, that local capacity is about efficiency, not just equity, right? It will be more equitable and we all like to have better distribution, but this is about implementing the programs the right way to have impact, not just in the communities, but to get the work done. So uh, along those lines, you know, that, that uh, final part of your answer allows me to segue into another question that specifically speaks to the housing sector. What should the housing sector do to ensure Puerto Rico built back better and what infrastructure is in place or will be in place to support this direction? Well, the, the, you know, besides what Ariane can talk about, about the policies for that sector, I will say that there are, there are two things in there. One is the number of CDCs. Both Ramon and I explore that in our papers. There are only about a dozen CDCs. CDCs are the nonprofit organization that specialize in implementing housing re rehabilitation, reconstruction, and new construction. They are, they are very few. So we have to build their capacity and expand. But the other problem is what EBIS is attending, which is how do you get current nonprofits that have all the potential to be converted into CDCs to actually implement those programs? How do you create the partnerships between the ones that have the know-how, the ones that have the staff that are local, that may have resources and assets to make, you know, to create impetus, right? But I, I'm gonna let the two of them correct me. Yes, uh, Ariam, go ahead. You had your hand up, I believe. Yeah, I think uh, just to add a little bit to what Edwin was saying, uh, just two things, right? One of the, the, the things, the way things are going right now is that each house that's being uh, rehabilitated or reconstructed, it's treated as an individual case rather than seeing like a neighborhood picture or a community vision, right? So that's one thing. Second thing is that those programs that do consider community level uh, interventions or municipal level interventions, uh, that are mostly planning programs have yet to start. I, they, they, they haven't started yet. So we're doing housing rehab and reconstruction, but the planning process hasn't been there yet. Right? So there's great disconnection between uh, the reconstruction process and the planning for reconstruction. Right? So addressing that issue is definitely something uh, important in order to build back better. Okay. Uh, does uh, any, uh, do any other panelists want to? Yeah, something I, I wanted to um, add to go back to the idea of the of the CDC. So CDCs have like a mission that is like geographical. And I, there's a lot of like nonprofits in Puerto Rico that operate in various municipalities. And that doesn't allow them to have like the, the knowledge or the capacity to put like a vision, as Ariam said, of a particular um, neighborhood and putting all your efforts in one place. And in terms of the technical assistance, um, partnerships, as like Edwin says, are very important. Um, so just like the technical assistance comes in the form of actually doing a project that you have never done, but with, with a bigger organization 
And that could be also an outside organization that is like um, helping you through that um, process of uh, like building the, the capacity of like creating housing onto a larger scale. Um, you know, one, one term that we have heard throughout these presentations that are, you know, uh, underscored in the, in the uh, articles in the volume is this idea of capacity building. What capacity building? What is needed? What, is ne what needs to be built to provide for the post-disaster reconstruction of Puerto Rico? If you can speak to that on any of the panelists. Well, you know, part of what, what we, the sort of the theory behind this is that there are different levels of capacity building. The ground foundation of all that capacity building is the staff, the professional people, whether you're gonna do a social ent an enterprise whether you're gonna do syndication of housing, where you're gonna do new construction, affordable uh, uh, housing, you need to have staff that is capable of doing this commercial development. The second level is organizational. You can have the staff, but if the organization doesn't have the balance sheet, the track record, the experience, you're not gonna get a contract to do a hundred units if you haven't done five or 10 before you do that. So. Capacity building for organizations is a gradual cumulative process, right? Just like small businesses, you're not gonna get contracts for 1 million if you haven't had, you know, for 5 million if you haven't done 1 million and so forth. The third level is I think uh, what, you know, you can describe as a sort of a, a sector strategy, right? When, when you create what we call an advocacy coalition because to change the policies, no one organization can do it. You really need, in, you, know, you need collective action to influence the way the public think about this and the, and the influencers that can actually affect public policy. So, so co collaborating and building coalitions, like some of the ones we, we know in Puerto Rico are emerging, is a very important, important part. And that strengthening required that you do a lot of activities and engagements, right? That bring those people together and, and work on a common agenda, right? That, that they develop this policy strategy. Uh, so anyway, I, I see it as an interactive process. You don't need to do one at a time and then the other, but they have to go together. They, you know, without the policy, you're not gonna make this money flow to local organizations. Okay, but without the capacity to use them, they're not going to be able to do the programs, right? So you have the needs, but you don't have the know-how. Anyways. All right. Uh, does any other panelists would like to uh, expand on, uh, on this question? Um, hearing none, I will then proceed to the next one. Uh, a, a very interesting question uh, that is very specific, I'm going to try to expand and make it a little bit broader is, uh, what about population specific programs? I mean, it is related to the fact that CDCs tend to be geographically specific, but what about population specific uh, programs? And this is in response to the, a more narrow question that talks about, are the specific programs targeted to assist Afro-Puerto Ricans throughout the island? And, you know, I know that Roberto, uh, you provided an answer, but can we speak about not just for Puerto Ricans, but, you know, population specific uh, groups in the island that may benefit from specific programs? Yeah, I can add to, to that. Um, so I, I, people have to like be able to apply for specific pots of funding. Like for example, if you're building housing, um, you have to say, okay, I'm building housing for families and you need to be able to develop your like um, two units um, or, or like having two bedrooms, three bedrooms, right? And that's very different than if you were going to do elderly housing. So I feel that a lot of, you will have to, in many occasions, specialize in the funding that you um, have to get and and there's some populations that um again might be outside of funding i hear a lot in puerto rico that we like to develop a student housing right and that actually is at odds with like what the funding that hot provides so just being able to understand those things is um is very important um but in terms of like a specialization the idea is like 
you get good at getting this type of money or developing these type of programs. And you can only do that if you um, do, do a, a specialize. Mm -hmm. okay. Anybody else? If, if I can um, answer this, there is a program that's being focused on, on farmers in agriculture, right? Uh, and the idea was to support farmers who are involved in um, ecological or agroecology, ecological um, projects, and uh, in a way support also the idea of um, sustainable agriculture in addition to um, sustainable food, right? The access to or reaching some level of um, food autonomy. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues that, that we have been learning about, about this is that the, uh, I think Edwin brings this up in, in the sense that uh, you have people, organizations who are receiving the funding, um, they are supposed to funnel this funding to the farmers. However, um, they don't have the capacity to uh, provide that funding to the farmers. And in one of these cases is um, the, the science and technology, the Puerto Rico Science and Technology Trust that were provided with the funding to manage the farming uh, aspect of, of these um, CBG funds, but they don't have any skills or any experience in their history on working with agriculture at all. So now you have small farmers and, and other organizations um, try, like struggling to apply for these funds and the trust does not provide the necessary support for these farmers to, to reach it. So what, what we're seeing in the camp level is that many camps are, who have people with the skills and the knowledge, not only in farming, but on, but on how to understand the application process of this funding, go out there, reach out to the farmers and prepare them to how they can implement, how they can apply for this funding. And, and again, this is uh, organizations at the base trying to fill in the gap between where the funding is being allocated and the access to that fund. Uh, thank you, Roberto. And in addition to Roberto, I want to thank all of our panelists this afternoon, um, Manuel Lobato, Marta Alvarez, Marinesa Ponte, uh, Jacqueline Villarrubia Mendoza, and Roberto again, um, Iris Garcia Zambrana, uh, Ariam Torres, and of course, Edwin Melendez. I would like you to um, uh, follow us if you are interested in more of the work that we do at the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, you can follow us at, you know, centropr.hunter.cuny.edu or connect via uh, Facebook and social media, uh, as well as uh, emails. Uh, I would also like to remind you that um, you will have in a, a, this presentation available uh, on our website uh, uh, shortly at Nation Builder. And, you know, I would also like you to please respond to the survey um, that uh, you will be uh, receiving shortly uh, on this particular webinar. Uh, and again, thank you to all the presenters. Thank you, the audience, for participating. And we will see you soon. Have a good day.